<laughs> I don't know why you'd want it. It tastes like poison. I don't understand the first guy that tasted an onion. I don't understand how, how he made that mainstream. It's the mo biggest marketing ploy of all time. Hey guys, before we start this episode, a big shout out to the Southern Slugs Footy Club and their support the last couple of years. They've been amazing. And speaking of the Southern Slugs, there's a big event that's happening over the June long weekend this year. It's over there in Bali, it's called the Bali Masters. So over 35s, over 45s and over 55s men. And the one and only Richard Champion, that ex-AFL legend from the Brisbane Lions is playing in it. And there'll be a bit of comedy as well from Tommy Seagat, um, better known as the suburban footballer, of course, a social media sensation. So it's going to be absolutely awesome over there and we're better to go as well than Bali for a June long weekend. So check out the Southern Slugs Football Club Facebook page for more details. It's going to be an absolute ripper. Well, what a pleasure it is for the very first time to have Clay McMath on Comedy Legends with Bevo. Happy to be here. Now you've got a show coming out. It's happening in March um, next month for the Adelaide Fringe with a couple other comedians as well. Yep. It's called Not Safe for Netflix. Uh, yep, tell, us, yep. tell us all about it, Clay. Uh, well, first, shout out to uh, Jay Michael and Justin Saw, my um, you know my partners in crime there for Not Safe for Netflix. It's just a show about we're just sort of voicing that little voice in your head that says the things that you don't say out loud. So whether you're on a date, um, you know, you've got staff at work that don't seem to be doing the job correctly or, or whatever it is, that voice in your head, we're sort of, we are that voice in, in this show, Not Safe for Netflix. So yeah, basically the, the premise is that we're too hot for the, the mainstream platforms to handle. I like it. Yeah. Can you give us a bit more, a bit more information, or is that as far as you can go? I, I don't <laughs> want to give any jokes away, but um, that's yeah, that's pretty much it. But we we've been touring together for about two years. The the three of us plus one one more comedian, Michael Bowley. But um, when it comes to Fringe, the shows are only fifty minutes long, so um, having four people sort of shrinks your time on stage. So we just we stuck to the three of us. But yeah, we've been touring for for a couple of years now, and we've become really close and. Um, yeah, we just wanted to, to put something together for the fringe. So is it something um, like a little bit more about taking the piss out of people that are so PC correct these days? Yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not taking shots at, at any particular groups of people or anything like that, that, um, some comedians are under fire for at the moment. <laughs> um, but it's just, yeah, it's just saying the things that supposedly aren't supposed to be said. Uh, it's not, it's not overly offensive, but. Um, it's just, yeah, stuff that you, you usually are keeping inside, I suppose. And how's it been received so far with the show? Oh, it's great. We, we, we sell out pretty much everywhere we go. It's mostly rural towns. So we've gone over to Kangaroo Island and done a lot of regional South Australia. We're going into Victoria later this year and, and into the Melbourne CBD as well. It's been really well received, sell a lot of tickets, get a lot of great feedback from people that come to see the show and also the staff at venues that, that are willing to have us back and want us, want us back maybe a bit sooner than we're even ready to go. So, nah, it's been great. And the boys, where'd you first get to connect with them? Just in the Adelaide comedy scene. I don't know, looking, looking back, it's, it's hard to, to remember really, but I know, I remember the first time I saw Jay Michael on stage it was before I even started comedy. My first date with my current partner, we, we went out for dinner and then we went to an open mic. I think it was like, I think it was an Easter long weekend. So it was the Monday night of a long weekend. We went to an open mic and um, Jay was on stage and he's going to kill me for saying this, <laughs> but he, uh, he forgot his jokes. He was, a bit, he was a bit greener back then and he pulled out his notes out of his pocket and his whole demeanor changed. He got so mad at himself and he was just like so angry. Tell all these jokes. And then um, Rach and I just like losing it at him. Just thought it was so funny. And a few years later, after I'd started comedy, I approached him. I was like, oh, dude, I remember you. I went, this, that, this happened. And he, he was like so embarrassed and like got mad again. I'm like laughing in his face. He doesn't even know me. <laughs> but um, all is forgiven. We're, yeah, good mates now and, you know, on the road together. And your own comedy journey? Because we were speaking a moment about uh, growing up because you were a very good basketball. You went over to the US and played college yep. ball and, and played footy you know, uh, with the Bays as well growing yep. up. But uh, where did the comedy journey come from, Clay? Where did that first start and, and where did you get the passion for comedy from? Always just had a passion for comedy. I think watching, watching it with my dad, I think when my parents split up, my dad ended up being the parent that got Foxtel. So there was a little <laughs> extra incentive to go over there and um, we would... We'd watch comedy, I think it was called the Comedy Channel. 
um, or Comedy Central or something like that. And um, yeah, I just remember watching watching all these comedians like um, Bill Burr and Bruce Bruce, uh, and just being on the on the couch with Dad, just like cracking up. And I was I always was like, oh, I'd love to do that. And then when LimeWire and Napster and stuff came out, I would I would pirate the um, the comedy specials, all the Dave Chappelle, Eddie Murphy, and all of that, and and just yeah, consume that more than anything. And once once my basketball career was over and I had the time, I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, give it a crack. In gig number one, do you remember what it was like? Yeah, I do. It was it was an open mic at Rhino Room, and just by coincidence, I think it was like like the tenth anniversary or something of this particular comedy night. So it was, it was sold out. And now when I go to open mics, if I go, it's, you know, 15 people in a 100-seat room and by the end of the show, you just, you just want to get in the car and go home and not talk to anybody because you're not getting much. But, yeah, this first night sold out, you know, 100-plus people in the room and um, absolutely crushed. And I was, oh, yeah, comedy is easy. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I've had some nightmare gigs since then, but. <laughs> oh, oh, please, please share. Oh, good, oh. Good to tell, good to tell those. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think. Oh, okay. So I went, I went to Perth last year for Fringe World and I was doing a solo show. And the first night I was there, um, I'm at the back of the room, like having a, having a water, watching the crowd walk in. And I'm just seeing, Person after person walk in there, I'm just like, okay, well, this is not my demographic. <laughs> I, like senior citizens, old ladies walking in the door. <laughs> the pre-show playlist is like fairly aggressive hip hop. A lot of N-words flying around the room. <laughs> and um, eventually it's time to get on stage. And I get on stage, I look at the crowd. And I'm just like, all right, let's, let's do this. And... Uh, just yeah, an hour of silence just about. I think oh. it was the worst gig I've ever done. And uh the next night I was like, I think I had yeah, I had a I had a panic attack the next day. I didn't wanna didn't want to go back and do my show. I went back the next day and just leveled the place. It was like the probably to this day the best gig I've ever done. Yeah. So yeah, in 24 hours what can change yeah. just based on the uh the demographic of the people walking in the room yeah. i don't know how that happened either with the marketing and stuff i i'm still perplexed by it wow that's a well that's an impressive effort though to yeah. go from down there to uh, like your best ever so, yeah yeah yeah, no, wow. was, yeah good good relief to to <laughs> come out of that gig like that i've always wondered as well because i've emceed events never done comedy before it was very close to doing it last year, but I had it, I wussed out in the end. Yeah, um, I've talked to you afterwards about that, about getting that confidence up. But yeah. Uh, yeah, how do you go with those situations where people just generally don't laugh? Because I've emceed events before, and also you know emceed weddings and what have you, mm -hmm. and told a joke which you think is quite funny, and a couple of your mates laugh, and then there's a few tables there that just give you absolute tumbleweeds. Yeah, well, <laughs> emceeing emceeing is a different skill set to comedy. You you really need to sell yourself, and um, the crowd has to has to like you. It doesn't really matter about what you're presenting. And uh, yeah, I, I, I had a bit of a blunder emceeing a mate's wedding, and um, I've vowed never to <laughs> never to MC Well, maybe a wedding again, let alone one of my friends. I prefer just to go and have a good time. But um, I went, and oh, it was requested that. When you introduce the groomsmen and bridesmaids, uh, roast everybody. <laughs> so I roasted everybody. I was I was pretty gentle, but there was there was one where I I used the c word. <gasps> oh no! And I used I used a joke that like in a stand up setting goes goes pretty well. Uh, at a wedding. <laughs> not so much no nah, not so much so um yeah i got the sweats pretty quickly after that took a seat and um just drank in the corner until i felt that everybody had forgotten about it and then i then i was able to have a good time but um yeah no nah, emceeing is a different skill set and uh i think it's yeah it's more about developing that relationship than it is about just like having pre-written gear i think yeah yeah and how do you go with hecklers and that sort of thing as well Depends on the heckler, I think. Yeah, sometimes it can go well, sometimes it can go poorly. Like, if it's just someone that's 
super drunk, you, you're not going to be able to engage with them because you're not going to get anything useful back. If it's, if it's someone that's just talking loudly, they are going to get their feelings hurt pretty quickly when you, when you call them out and that's going to disrupt the show. But you just got to, you just have to address whatever's happening. If you're bombing, you've got to address it. The crowd can see it. If they feel like you don't know or something, they're going to feel sorry for you or embarrassed for you. So you've got to call it out. Just be like, oh, geez, like this, you know. Tough this, crowd. Yeah, yeah this yeah. did well, you know, in whatever <laughs> town. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't happen too much. Yeah, don't mean to pat myself on the back. But. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the material for your shows, like I know obviously this one is a, is a different situation, but um, going back to when you first started, mm. yeah, where did you get the material for your shows from? I'm, I'm more of a storyteller, so I don't do a lot of one on, uh, one-liner gear. Um, I'd like to uh, test myself a bit and do, do a little bit more of that, but um, I just re- lived experience, exaggerate uh, observations and create stories and, and that. So, yeah, it's just all, there's nothing really, I can't off the top of my head think of a joke that isn't from an experience that I've had. Yeah. So you've, you've lived a pretty funny life while it's it? So. Oh, yes and no. <laughs> I think, yeah, comedy comes out of tragedy sometimes as well. So, yeah. um, no, nah, just making stuff funny. So, yeah, you can see something and sort of have the understanding that it, it's likely a shared experience. A lot of people have gone through this but may, maybe haven't thought about it the same way you've thought about it or put the same level of weight into it that you put into it. So you can turn, you know, a grocery shopping experience into into something that that really affected you or really you know lived in your head le- like you couldn't you couldn't let this situation go like Larry David like Kerber enthusiasm like they're all such exaggerated situations but situations you can relate to nonetheless and is there someone like a, you're talking to AFL players and and sports people and that they have like influences and mentors and that does the comedians, or do you have someone that you you talk to a bit that you get some advice from? That's maybe like a senior comedian. No, I don't. I, some, comedians do have that. I haven't. I probably haven't developed that relationship yet. But with the guys I tour with, we we bounce a lot of ideas around. So we've got like a group chat. I'll say I'll either just like dip a premise in there and say like, "Oh, uh, what if what if this happened? Would this be funny?" And they might say like, "Oh yeah," and and this and this, or um, or they'll say like, "No, nah, there's nothing there." So like. Yeah, we've got that group chat, but no, I don't. I don't have a mentor per se. Were you a bit of a joker at high school, for example? Or high school? No, no, no. Yeah. High school was a nightmare. I hated high school. Um, <laughs> every day was hell. So you and me both. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't wait. I couldn't <laughs> wait to graduate and get out of there. And then, yeah, funnily enough, I didn't have the I didn't have the right credits to go to college, and I had to do an extra year just to yeah, sort of rub my face in the dirt there a little bit. But um, no, high school not not a class clown. Probably, you know, actually, I was probably a bit uh, bitter towards the class clowns, actually. Like, just <laughs> shut up so I can get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so the funny stories came from post-school then? I, I guess life, lifelong experiences. I've got a joke. I won't tell the joke, but, like, I, I was getting recruited for AFL for a little bit. So I, I went around, um, I think it was five or six AFL teams. I went and did fitness testing and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. And one... Uh, one team didn't bother with the physical stuff and just wanted to meet with me and sort of figure out my history and, and all this. And the recruiter was, I don't know, 80 years old. And he's just like, like the eye test kind of guy. And we're in a packed cafe and he, he stands me up and he's, he's like touching me all over my, all over my body. And like, what? <laughs> yeah, like checking out how strong I am and how big I am. And um, yeah, so like I've got this joke about that where I, I, f- I didn't know whether I was getting recruited or uh, like being sold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that is pretty random. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you mentioned the AFL. Um, mm-hmm. Were you close to, you know, you met, you played Glendale Juniors. Yeah. Were you close to getting drafted or? I didn't, uh, I didn't declare for the draft or I don't, I don't even know how, how the draft works, but um. I don't know if this rule is still a thing, but there was something called the alternative talent rule where they were sort of getting talent from other sports and having them as like a category B rookie or something like that. Yes. Yep. 
Yeah. And so I was, I was like going down that pathway, not, not really seriously. Cause I was still, um, I was still actively playing basketball and pursuing that. And that's what I've loved my whole life. Paddy Bynes, you might've met before I played basketball against perhaps he went to Australia in the juniors and then got picked up by the West Coast Eagles. Of Caterpie, okay. Caterpie yeah. Routine. And like Hugh, Hugh Greenwood. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a guy for the Crows, Ben, Dow- ben Dowdle. I don't know if, um, like, I don't know if he's really a big name in the football world, but um, just someone I know. But yeah, that that sort of um, pathway is where where I was going, and yeah, had a pretty good chance to to sign with uh, Hawthorne. Oh. Uh, not that I would have played any AFL games, but um, that was a year that they won a premiership, like in twenty fifteen or something. Yeah. Unreal. And, and your basketball, you played for, for the state and then you went over the US college system, like you mentioned before. Um, did you get close to playing NBL? Somewhat. I was with, I was like in the squad for uh, the Townsville Crocs, like a year or two before they um, went into voluntary administration. So I played preseason with them and then I, I, like, I stayed there. I trained with them every day, um, but I didn't get any uh, regular season games. Yeah. And what was the experience like US college? College is just like, it's just like a, a bubble. It was almost like five years of COVID. Like <laughs> I went to a small school, 3,000 people, and they were the 3,000 people that I saw every day. Like you don't leave campus for much unless you go into the movies or, you know, go into the store or whatever. Um, so yeah, it was a pretty, it was a pretty weird experience. It was like, like if you lived at high school, I guess, because um, it was, yeah, it was almost just like a big high school. The basketball side of things, yeah, probably didn't go in my favor in hindsight. Probably would have made a different decision with the school I went to. But um, I ended up having one, uh, one of my best childhood friends signed with the same school as me. So I, I was there for five years. So four out of those five years, I was with him, which was amazing. Yeah. Is it like what you see in the movies, like big parties? and Big parties, yeah. fraternity stuff where, where I was not so much. But yeah, big parties, red cups, oh. beer pong, uh, debauchery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what made you like come back to Adelaide then? I thought you want to stay just, over there. I was gone family. for a long time. Yeah. I was gone for a long time. I wasn't going to stay in America. Early in my career, I thought I was going to be an NBA player. And so I, that would have made me stay. But um, pretty early into my college career, I realized that wasn't going to be in the stars for me. So... I just, yeah, came, came back to Australia and played over here. And after a few years of that, I, uh, I was just like, I've been, I've been away from Adelaide enough and wanted to come home. And what was the experience like, like playing college ball? Because it's pretty competitive over there. From what yeah, yeah. There's some, like, I played against a lot of guys that ended up having NBA careers, um, short and long. So you get to see, you get to see this talent uh, early and you can tell. You, you're just like, oh, okay, he's... He's gone to the league. Like they're just a, a step above not only everyone on your team, but everyone on their team. And yeah, make it look easy. The game looks slow. And yeah. And was there any European clubs or other clubs knocking your door as well post college or? Oh, not, not any, you know, FC Barcelona's or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we spoke before about you've got a, a podcast called Welcome to the Potty. Mm hmm. Um, Tell us about how this all came about and, and your love for movies as well, Clay. So the podcast, the podcast started with a, a teammate of mine when I was still playing. I had to take a, a week off to go to go to a funeral in New Zealand. And basically for this entire trip, all the travel, all the time in my hotel room, I was listening to um, a podcast. And I like like any idiot, I was like, oh, I could do this. And um, I came back and I was like, dude, we've got to start a podcast. <laughs> I went to JB Hi-Fi and got like a USB mic and um, got started. So I think the first seven episodes of the show were like pretty, pretty low quality. And we didn't really have a direction. It was like just talking about NBA and, and hip hop and just, yeah, roasting pop culture. <laughs> uh, and then when... When I left that team, I sort of, I wanted to continue doing it and I went solo and the show stayed like that for a while. And then I added Clay's reviews as a, 
as a uh, segment. And then a couple of years, probably five years went by like that. And then I was like, this whole, the show is the, the movie reviews. This is where I get all the feedback. This is, yeah, where, where the engagement is. So I changed the format of the show. It's always stayed the same name. It's always been Welcome to the Potty. But now the format is one movie a week, review it, tell stories based on whatever the movie is that I've seen. So like I try to relate on a personal level to an aspect of the film. So it doesn't, doesn't have to be like if I watch a, an action film, it doesn't have to be like some, some action packed story, but, um, like, like John Wick is like, there's a big story about like the hotel that they go in. So like I've spent a lot of time in hotels. So when I watch John Wick movies, I can give a, you know, a hotel story. How good. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got one, Taylor Swift, obviously everyone's talking about her at the moment. Yeah. Her, yeah. Her tour around Australia and. Amsterdam, she was a part of that. And, and recently you said you did a review about that and it went gangbusters. Yeah. I, and I think, I think it's just based on that I put Taylor Swift in the tag and it's, it's Super Bowl week. Taylor Swift was on the TV a lot. She's on social media a lot. People are looking her up. And um, yeah, that, that clip on, on YouTube just went, went crazy. And I think, I think it's more based on the fact that I tagged <laughs> Taylor Swift than, than maybe it being a Decent film review. Yeah. <laughs> what's the what's the best Taylor Swift movie that you've done a review for? I don't know. Is she in another movie? Oh, Cats. <laughs> I, I, I didn't watch Cats. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry if anyone did see Cats because I heard it was a bit of a nightmare. But maybe she should stick to singing from your from your understanding, perhaps. Or uh, yeah, I'd say so. Or yeah. uh, um, <laughs> you know, being a an NFL super fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I like it. <laughs> and how's like how do you actually re- choose what movie you're going to review? Like, um, is it you, at the moment, it's Valentine's Day today, and mm-hmm. so do you sort of choose a, a certain thing based on what's happening at the moment? Is that how yeah? It sometimes. So for this month, February, first two weeks, we've we've gone with romance movies, and then the next two weeks, because it's Black History Month, we're going with like black movies, like your hood films, Boys in the Hood, Belly, Baby Boy, all that all that type of stuff. So we'll, we'll choose a couple, and it's uh, it's me and. One of my best friends, Lavelle, who who helps me out with the podcast. So we alternate each week who chooses the movie. And if we don't have a theme, it's just pick a movie and we'll we'll do it. Yeah. Love it. Now, I've been uh, doing my bit of research, Clay, and uh, getting a bit of dirt about you. So uh, I've heard that you've got a bit of an allergy to onions. Is this correct? <laughs> it may as well be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I cannot stand onions. I don't care what it's in. I can taste it. You tell me you can't taste it. If you can't taste it, why would you put it in there? Answer that. So, so not even a, not even like your bolognese, no pizza, no. So you're telling me that the best thing, you know, I reckon going to Bunnings and getting a snag with sausages and onions. You're no onion man. No onion. Wow. No onion. Wow. Sausage bread <laughs> sauce. <laughs> no onion. No. Nah. Unbelievable. No. Nah. Yeah. So I, I've got a friend who um. We were out one night and he um, he said, oh, you know, no, I was wrapping up. He's like, let's go, let's go get a Euros. I was like, yep. Um, he, he went and got him, brought him back. I bite into it, mouthful of onion. I start spitting it out everywhere, <laughs> just exaggerating. Like I'm, you know, pretty toasted at this point. And uh, I'm like, dude, I could die. I could die. I'm, I'm deathly allergic. I eat. The color just drained from his face. And um, I didn't tell him. I didn't tell him, I don't think, until the next day maybe or, or even later than that, that I was just... It wasn't Stephen Coon by the Yeah, time. yeah. <laughs> I <love> yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I cannot do onion. No. <laughs> so you're obviously one of those people that start crying when you're cutting them up. So Why would I be cutting it up? <laughs> just for, just for someone's barbie? Or, no, 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 not me. Not, not me. No, I, look... <laughs> Sometimes, if you go get a subway, I don't know why you get a subway either. But shout out to subway. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you get a subway. But sometimes their their little ingredients get mixed up because they, you know, they grab it and some maybe some onion drops into the lettuce. If there's a piece of onion down the the other end of a of a subway, I can taste it on the top end. Well. I don't need it in my life. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want it. It tastes like poison. I don't understand the first guy that tasted an onion. I don't understand how, how he made that mainstream. It's the mo- biggest marketing ploy of all time. 
I've heard that you're pretty good on the mic, not just as comedy, but also doing a bit of rapping as well. I heard. I, I like to I like to dabble. I like to dabble. Steve again, he's he's pretty musically inclined, and he's produced a lot of uh, like hip hop beats. And we actually we actually uh, released a mixtape on SoundCloud six seven years ago called um, called 1990 under under Clay Flowers. It was under and um, still still listen to it from time to time, and I think it's pretty good. But every year for for my fringe shows. I create a promo of a rap song. So there's a song, Crash, I think, by Dave. He's a um, like UK rapper. And I, I, yeah, I just use their beat and their flow and change the lyrics to promote my show. Brilliant. Yeah, so I did that a couple of years ago on that one. And um, last year was a, a Drake and 21 Savage song, I think. And I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do this year, but I've probably got to get it done this week because we're coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up on uh, Fringe on this Friday. So, yeah. I love it. Well, Clay McMath, thanks so much for joining us on Comedy Legends of Bevo, no, mate. Thanks for having me. And uh, don't forget to check out Not Safe for Netflix, um, March the 5th to the 9th at Howling Hour. Howling Hour. Um, tell a friend, tell a friend. Bring a friend. Group tickets. Uh, we'll get you a, a discount as well. Six, six plus, I think, groups. And... Um, yeah, concession tickets, all that, all that jazz. I was going to give a, a discount code, but just, just bring six people. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Oh.